Will the next panel please come up? Hello, everyone. My name is Bernard Siegel, Executive Director of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation and founder and co-chair of the World Stem Cell Summit. Um, to the audience that is watching this live streamed or uh, taped later, we hope that you uh, have enjoyed our presentation so far here on our last day. And I think truly we can say this meeting is an exhausted volcano, but it's not over yet. We have a really distinguished panel chaired by uh, Dr. Julie Allickson of Wake Forest School of Medicine, the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And here we're going to discuss some of the manufacturing challenges that our, that our field faces. Dr. Allickson. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. We're excited to be here today, um, rounding up the end of the conference. <laughs> Um, and we're hoping to be able to get everybody's questions, and we're going to start off, kick, kick off the meeting with some questions. I just wanted to give an introduction, but we have um, three really well-known um, participants in the field, um, highly regarded in manufacturing and challenges associated with it. We have Dr. Ian McNeese, who's from CellMed Consulting. Uh, Claudia Zalzeberg from Akron Biotechnology, and Bazad Madavi from Lanza. So we're really excited to have them part of the panel, and um, just wanted to talk a little bit about how complicated manufacturing is and how we really need to look at other solutions. There are a lot of efforts ongoing, consortiums and so forth getting together, governments putting in money, looking at how we can address these challenges. So it's very significant especially as we move to tissue engineering where we have cells and we have a, a scaffold and produce a construct from that, like bladder and urethra. As we look at the different cell types, we have different challenges. Um, there's a big difference between the autologous cells and the allogeneic, and as we move to gene therapy, we have uh, a significant more complications. There's a lot of biomaterials. What do we use? Do we use a synthetic that we can produce the same all the time? Or are we using a decellulized organ or, or something um, that's biological in nature? So it's, it's really a challenge as we move forward. There are a lot of devices. The bioprinter is being um, significantly looked at, especially by FDA with regulations. How will they be able to regulate that in the, in the future? It's going to be another option for the uh, tissue organ shortage. And then as we look at scaffolds, which I described, do we use a decellulized scaffold, do we print a scaffold, um, or we do, do we use biomaterials? And so this is how we've set up for translation at the Institute, where we have these um, core groups that come together to, that are be able to channel into the pipeline for translation. So we're really fortunate to have that set up where there's experience, expertise, and they can do the testing that then follows through with process development, manufacturing, and then potentially to commercialization. And this is just, um, not to be read, but just to show you there's a lot of components. It doesn't cover everything. But as we're moving along the pipeline, there are many significant areas where we really have to look at challenges and how we can uh, overcome those. So as we're looking at a project, we really want to know, does it solve a clinical need? Is it better than what we have that's out there? We want to look at the cost benefit. Is it within reach? Likely that, that the technology will work? And then will it be able to be produced in a timely manner? So with that, I'm going to go back to our panel. We have uh, Ian McNeese, Claudia Zalzeberg, and Bazad Madavi. And so um, <clears throat> we're going to start out with some questions. OK, so I'd like to thank everyone again for, for sticking around. Um, so as we look at developing cellular therapy products and we look at the regulations which are really based on drug products, which, you know, how, how will we be able to define the manufacturing processes? And some, some of the things I was thinking about was, you know, as we focus on non-destructive testing um, for lot release and how do we conserve our final product if it's in a closed or a semi-closed system to protect the product, um, but how are we able to meet the regulations for a drug and maybe a non-viable as, as we're producing this biological product? Any comments on that? Um, 
I just will take one piece of it, and I know that the manufacturing of these products require a, com a great complexity of, uh, of the raw material side, which is one of the areas that we focus on. Uh, it's not only the process, but it's also whatever you put into that process for the cells to move on and be what you want them to be. Uh, so eventually, uh, the compliance in terms of uh, how these raw materials will behave with the cell um, have to be somehow standardized so the variable, which is the cell, can be more predictable. And that's what we are focusing right now. And on the raw material side, how can be, uh, these raw materials be standardized and be able to provide all the level of safety that is needed for the cells to uh, be uh, using the processes that are being defined by our customers. Yeah, I guess the example I'd use in terms of taking product from, um, for release criteria, et cetera, in bone marrow transplant, there's quite a lot of experience with directed products. So you really have a single product manufactured for a single patient. And in that setting, it's very typical to use up to 5% of the final product for testing. And I, I think that could be a good, um, at least, target for us to use in, um, in, in, in the release criteria. And, and obviously, you would like to use more to be more thorough in the testing. But I think there has to be minimize, min, trying to minimize the final testing to the key components of sterility and in a toxin as much as possible and then depends again on how much, um, what type of product it is, how much is expansion versus what you get from a, a, a collection is what you have to work with. I, I agree, definitely. So um, as we're looking at allogeneic cell therapy following the big pharma uh, model, um, should we be less worried about manufacturing commercialization challenges as a segment of the market? because there's so much experience in pharma, or how? Uh, no, that's actually a very uh, good uh, question. And uh, um, when we look at the allergenic, I think uh, we need to look at this uh, from uh, two perspectives. The first perspective is more uh, looking from the business model perspective. And sometimes there's a misconception, I think, in the industry, because when you look at the business model in the allergenic area, the business model is uh, quite similar to pharma model in the sense that you have a centralized manufacturing, the patient is not necessarily part of the supply chain, uh, you have an off-shelf uh, distribution. So all of these uh, uh, kind of the advantages which are very similar to pharma model. However, when you are looking from the manufacturing perspective, uh, I think uh, there is a disconnect. And uh, we should not be, not worry actually about the manufacturing part of that. And the reason behind that is uh, because we are still a major uh, uh, majority of the uh, uh, clinical trials are still in the 2D. And when you are in the 2D actually, so it means that you have no benefit of the scale up. So everything becomes a linear, your cost becomes linear, everything becomes linear. And from this perspective now, when you think about the pharma model, the ratio between the selling price you know, to uh, cost of the goods sold is not the same anymore. But this is not necessarily the most, I would say, uh, important part. The real important part, I think, when we think about the allergenic is, are we really able to deliver the larger quantity that we promised? And I think to illustrate that, it's very good to take a very simple example. You know, when, for example, we think about the MSCs, a kind of the uh, very average volume of uh, 200 million uh, per doses, when you just think about the 5,000 patients, this is one trillion cells. So one trillion cells, you need 2,000 cell factories in order to produce them. So if you target, for example, now for this therapy, one million patients, you need 400,000 10 stacks cell factory per year. So the question even before the cost is, can we really operate that or not? And I think this is a, sometimes uh, is overlooked, I think, by the drug developers, but also, uh, I think, by the investors. And uh, uh, this is something we need to pay attention because what happened, you know, most of the therapies right now, they are in the phase two. They're going to phase three in a few years, and then they're going to hit a wall. 
And the reason behind that, because then, you know, they don't have a solid business case in terms of the quantity they can deliver, in terms of the cost. So this is a very important uh, part of that. And the beauty also in this uh, uh, area of the uh, allogenic, I think, is the solution is there. For example, at Lonza, you know, we are, uh, actually we have developed already a bioreactors based uh, uh, system uh, with the digestible macrocarriers. And when you go towards this type of the system, then you become very actually similar to pharma. And actually, we are using our experience in the pharma industry, in the protein production, in order really to have a very solid industrial uh, uh, platforms. So the solution are there, but I think the shift is not there yet. Um, and this is something because I think the element has been overlooked. So we need to push it, you know, from the drug developer perspective, but also I think from the investors, but also, you know, from the, to some extent, governmental subsidies and so on. Yeah, can, can I follow up on that? Do you, do you think that the bioreactors are out there that we really need? Because in, in my world with tissue engineering, we pretty much have to customize what we need for our organs and tissues. So I know you're talking about cells and scaling up, and we definitely need that, and then moving to automation. But do you feel like right now you could, you know, you have access to the size of bioreactors and what, what you need to be able to produce this product if we need to produce it for a thousand patients? Uh, absolutely, because when I uh, come back to the example, for example, for the one trillion cells, when we talk about the 2,000 you know, cell factories, in a bioreactor system is equivalent of the 600 liters bioreactors. Yeah. So now if you want necessarily to, for example, manage your risk, is equivalent of three times 200 liters bioreactors. Yeah. And this is something, for example, we have already done that at the 50 liters, uh, and it's uh, proven, so it's, it's not necessarily complex you know, in terms of the technology. You, you need to have a good expertise. But at the same time, also, when you look at this, when you have the right platform at the beginning, you solve a lot of issues at the same time. Because right. when you do that, you reduce your production cost, absolutely. But at the same time, also, your investment cost. Because in terms of the surface you need, and this is expensive uh, part of the manufacturing, uh, you need at least 90% less. Right. Uh, the other thing also is really a question of the quality, which comes also with that, because now you can uh, adapt uh, the strategy, for example, like a feeding your media strategy with uh, reduce uh, your cost again, but also you know, uh, in terms of the control, online control. Right. Uh, uh, so these are yes. the elements yeah. that actually can also increase your capabilities. So the technologies, uh, yes, are, are, are there. So you, you brought up a lot of issues. So um, <laughs> about media, let's talk about media. Could, be, before we get on, oh, could, sorry. just to get back to this question. So I, I think we've actually been misdirected with the pharmaceutical models. Um, yes. One of the questions I'd put out, I don't believe that a MSC product, for example, that's sort of passage two is the same as a, as a cellular product, an MSC product that's a passage six, passage seven. So if you've got to go through this amount of scale up, you need to be able to understand are the cells biologically the same? Will they have the same performance clinically? And I don't see how we can answer that until we've got clinical data showing efficacy. So this is a little bit of the chicken and the egg in my, in my opinion. I think a lot of the parameters that are being looked at, you don't have the mechanism to truly evaluate the end product in a meaningful way. You've got surrogates that I don't think are relevant that are being used to phenotype or something like that. And so I think, we're, I think we've been really misguided by the pharmaceuticals approach in terms of trying to scale up and when we don't have enough data to really understand the quality of the products that are manufactured under different systems and we don't have preclinical models that are truly predictive for human cells. So I actually, I actually would like to see us move away from the discussion of scale up because I think we need a lot more clinical data before we are in a position to really have that discussion. And I think that's absolutely true. And uh, especially when you change the system, you know, all these questions uh, come up, you know, do we have the same type of the cells? Uh, and these are the, uh, I think we are years away before really can uh, uh, relate, for example, all these uh, analytical results to the uh, uh, efficacy, you know, in the uh, clinical. Uh, but one thing I think we can do, and that's why actually we try to encourage people to start with the right platforms at the beginning. Because basically, if you start with the right platform at the beginning, and then you try to get them you know, in a constant way up to the uh, higher scale. But what's the right then, platform? 
how do you decide what the right platform is? If you don't have a readout, yes. how do you know what's right and what's wrong? The, the, the right platform, the, the way I, 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 I try to describe that is more looking from the industrial perspective in the sense that... But you're just looking at scale then. You're not really taking into account the biology of the cells. All you're looking at is convenience. Yes, but the, once you know you have the convenience and you uh, can say, actually, I can reach my industrial volume, then whatever you get you know, out of this by reactors, this is your product. And then this product is going to go bring to the cell therapy. I think your but point this, is very but, valid right, right, but when this, you change the system. But this comes back to, the, I think, what the, the underlying problem we have in this field. Yes. We're based on the, on the drug model. Drugs are manufactured in a very different way. They are typically... Um, well-defined, chemically, genetically, yes. they're a DNA, pro you know, an RNA product. You've got a lot more control. You can add many things to the product. They're much easier to set up preclinical models where you can test and then you can actually compare if you m make a change in the manufacturing, do you get the same in vivo, in vivo effect potentially yes. in an animal model? We can't do that with cells. If you put cells into an animal, you've got to put immunosuppression in. Otherwise, they're, just, they're going to have a xeno rejection. So I don't think we're ready to make the statements that you... I, I, I don't see how you can make the statements of what's optimal, again, when we don't have any ability to really understand the clinical benefit. I think we need to be much more flexible and keep our, our minds open because we're going to have to eventually have a positive result. We can then say, OK, now when we change something, do we get the same result? Can we find a surrogate yes. to predict the clinical outcome? And I, I think we are saying exactly the same thing, and, and I think just uh, you know, to make it clear, what you're saying is absolutely true when we come to the changes into the process. But the, for example, today, you know, when you grow that in the 2D and you keep it that all the way along, so who tells you you are in the optimal you know, situation? And this is the same thing. So now if you take, for example, in a set of the 2D, at the beginning you take a 3D, and now you keep it you know, in the same way, you know, at the end, you are going to have one product, which is different, you know, to the other. But, you know, at least whatever you get, and if the clinical results are there, then you have an industrial, you know, platform at the same time. I think we're on the same page. It's just, you know, the, the, the way, you know, you're looking at the, this is different. I just wanted to step out a little bit of that discussion and say that, well, this is perhaps the landscape for missing chymos themselves, not necessarily. Uh, we can say that is the same landscape for immunotherapies um, nowadays or other cell types where maybe the centralized model definitely may not work and eventually we need to find a way to um, perhaps look into a hybrid situation where you have a centralized part but you eventually either you deploy or uh, in other ways you can um, um, build an infrastructure that is more decentralized and controlled remotely. So there are other opportunities. This actually, I think, is a disruptive time in our industry with uh, technologies that are available to us and perhaps others that will be created to uh, fill the needs, not only the allogeneic side, but also the autology side and yes. perhaps also the organ, because organs are very much personalized, I assume. I, th I think that's a good segue to talk about standards and standardization. I know, um, Claudia, you're involved in a lot of the different standards um, and ISO standards and the NIST effort and everything. Can we talk a little bit about how we feel those standards are going to help the field? Uh, I truly believe that when you want to industrialize a process, you need to standardize. Otherwise, you will never be able to make it uh, a more um, a high scale for other uh, or larger scale for other purposes. So the standardization in some areas is quite important. Uh, we started the effort of ISO with, together with NIST. Uh, and I know that standards is becoming a little bit of more, more relevance as we move into the industry and trying to commercialize those products. And uh, actually the first guidance that most likely will be available shortly, I, in, I think in about a year or two, will be the ancillary materials. Because the truth is the cells uh, need a lot of complex components to make it uh, their product. It's not like when you manufacture a monoclonal antibody or a recombinant protein, which is also a biopharmaceutical or biotech product that you can use buffers or eventually uh, very upstream is the media where the um, cells will grow. And that is already very well standardized. With cell therapy, each cell will have a complexity in their media 
that requires a little bit of more standardization in the manufacturing of those components. Um, they are quite undefined in some ways. So that's where the efforts are moving along in the ancillary material size, in the media size, in the bioprocessing, uh, transportation, logistics, and in the banking arena. So there are a lot of uh, efforts going into that aspect, which I think that will help the industry to have a framework to work with. Thank you. How, how do you feel that would affect your positions in a consulting firm and an industry with the standards coming out? Um, so I struggle with the standards because coming from a background of bone marrow transplant, where there have been no standards um, for, we've been doing this for 50 years, there's thousands and thousands of patients that have benefited from this th therapy. City 34 content of the product is used as a sort of minimal criteria for phoresis products. It's not used for, for marrow or for cord blood. So I, I, I'm concerned that we might head in a direction with good intentions without really, under, without having the right answers. and things being put in place for the, to, to have something there, and I'm not sure it's going to be rigorous enough that it's really going to benefit. So I think it needs to be thought about very carefully. Um, you know, the, the composition of cell products, we don't, if, if you take um, bone marrow, for example, the presence of CD3 T cells is essential in an allogeneic setting to get, an, um, a graft versus leukemia effect, for example. So even though you might want something more pure, you might want it more defined, that might but not be as an effective a product. So how do we standardize a lot of these things? I don't have the answers and I would prefer to have nothing than have standards that are not accurate. So I, I probably come a little bit to different perspective on this. Yeah, because I, I will say it gives us some guidelines. It's not going to necessarily be prescriptive unless it's uh, viability staining or something that someone might want a protocol off the shelf. But for me, I look to the standards a lot in regards to tissue engineering, ASTM, and a lot of standards focused on sterility and, and the biomaterials. So that might be a little bit different than, than the cell therapies. Um, Basad, how do you how do you feel about the standards? You know, I, I think standards. I think again, uh, w when we develop a drug, when we have a commercial uh, goal, I think we need to do that in a kind of the integrated uh, business model, which includes you know all these elements. Uh, so the question of the standards is uh, uh, wherever I think if we can and we have you know the, the, the enough knowledge uh, uh, to use that, I, I think you know we should go in that direction. But some of the elements, you know, because if all the processes are the same, then there is no benefit also for the any drug developers. So we cannot be 100% the same, but the, uh, that's why you know, we need to define you know, the elements which are kind of the strategic, which add value to us, which differentiate us you know, to others, uh, either in terms of the efficacy or in terms of the financials, and uh, uh, then try you know, to focus on those, but not necessarily try to invent everything, to have everything different. You know, from the transportation is different, uh, the, uh, um, you know, uh, cryopreservation is uh, different. And this is sometimes that we see, you know, this uh, tendency in industry. So I think we need to see where is our focuses, have the strategic advantages to focus on those, but try to bring standards uh, in other areas if possible. I agree. And it has to be kind of everybody's voice because what happens is then FDA acquires that as requirements when you're taking something to an IND. They may say you have to do it according to 10, 10, 10 or, you know, a certain standard. So I, I think we do need to be careful. We'll, we'll develop But also standards. becomes an issue uh, later on in terms, again, I'm, I'm thinking always about commercialization. Because if you develop something which is, uh, uh, you know, adapted to your situation, then, you know, you need to think also who is going to, you know, uh, uh, provide you at the commercial scale. So, so there is a lot of you know challenges you bring in and again if it is worth it yes you know it's worth to do that but otherwise um, I think we need to avoid you know this type of the tendency to develop everything uh, in all part of the process yeah we are and actually I just would add to add that because these cell therapies travel the world uh, and travel cross boundaries uh, the guidance on some standards is going to be a, a very important part because the way that Perhaps these lab manufacture the cell therapies may be different in Japan, may be different in Europe, and even though it's supposed to be the same product. So uh, I think that the standardization without going 
not one extreme nor the other. I think that at the end of the day, it gives a framework, which sometimes is needed. Yeah, I agree, because the regulations are going to be different. If we're producing a product in the EU in phase one, we have to meet GMP, whereas here we're on a sliding scale. So I, th I think that's very important. Um, I want to change just a little bit and talk about potency testing. This came up at another session. And potency testing and phase one clinical trials, FDA says, you need a plan. But they really don't require the potency testing till phase three. We know that that guides us. It guides the patients we treat. It, you know, and it's gonna, it, it would guide the testing and the endpoints, and, and it's very significant. So do, um, do you feel as though that's the right decision to hold off for the potency? to allow people to scale up and determine what it is? Or do you think it could be detrimental in the fact that we might not really understand everything that we need to um, in phase one, moving to phase two, to pick our patient population and so forth? How, how do you feel about the potency requirements? And that would be in the US. I, I, this is clearly the chicken and the egg again. I mean, it's, um, I can't see how you can develop an accurate potency assay without having clinical data. You've got to know what your benefit's going to be and what surrogate and then predicts your outcome. So in the absence of at least some uh, minimal phase one data, and I think I, I, I like the way the FDA has approached this because I think in your phase two, when you've got a larger patient population, you get enough data to really evaluate. And I think in phase one, what you can do is really use it as a test because you're going to have to make some guesses here and say we think these are important markers or we think this is an important function of the cells that you can test in vitro. And so you then need to run a significant amount of patients through with that test to verify it. So validation of the potency I think can't be done with cell products in the absence of clinical data. So I think the FDA's approach is exactly what's needed. And also the characterization of the cells, but knowing what the cells are, knowing a lot about the cells before going into the potency is quite critical. So understanding quite a bit uh, in terms of characterization is key moving forward into the potency. Yes. No, I agree. Uh, again, it's not the, uh, uh, the area of my expertise, but uh, I agree with uh, what uh, Jan is saying. You know, you need to understand and, and try, you know, to relate, you know, the, the cells, uh, the characteristic, you know, to the clinical, uh, uh, you know, efficacy, and you need to have some data, you know. It's, it's I agree. So I'd, I'd like to open it up and see if somebody in the audience has a question or if you have a comment in regards to something that we've talked about already, the potency. It would be great if, if it's a little interactive. I know it's late in the afternoon, but um, would love to take any questions if anybody has some. Do we have any cell manufacturers here? Anybody that's in translation, clinical translation, producing a product? Okay, so we're just going to continue, but if you have a question, you know, please, please come up to the microphone. Um, so as we're moving along, a lot of people are talking about quality by design. Is that something that we think we, we want to implement right away? We want people to understand. We might want programs in that area, more focus on it. Of course, uh, pharmaceutical is, is more used to that model, but should we be bringing it into academia where we're doing translation? Um, how, how do you feel about that? Um, my take is the quality has to be built up from the very beginning. And uh, the more quality attributes you build at the beginning, the easier is the transition uh, within the phases. Uh, I think that quality by design at the very beginning it seems like a, li a little bit of a major task, but uh, you can build the elements to get there at, as you move along into the preclinical phase one and phase two. Um, and I know that because quality requires standardization is the chicken in the egg. You need a little bit of uh, both elements to work and interact to build it up. But the quality by design, and I know that it's something that is embedded into the pharmaceutical world, I'm not sure it applies to all the cell therapy products, but eventually, um, perhaps the allogeneic ones, uh, they're more similar to the pharma space, will have more to say about that, but eventually the autologous, I think that knowing the quality attributes and be able to understand the quality standardization of some of the processes will help quite a bit, but that's my take. 
Yeah, I, I guess I probably would focus more in terms of quality programs across the facilities than having them more um, product oriented. So I think um, a lot of the facilities have set up quality programs and it's sort of a, a downstream benefit of those quality programs having a manufacturing being undertaken with standard operating procedures using best quality materials. I, I think a lot of this comes in manufacturing already just by, by the nature of how people go about doing um, clinical manufacturing. And I think, I think it's something that can't be um, underplayed and it really is essential to the success of this whole field. If you start to get sterility problems or you start to have um, variations coming into your manufacturing, so you, you need very rigorous um, procedures. It's actually something where I think academia struggles with because academics typically come from, they wake up in the morning, they have a new idea, they want to come in and change the way they do things, that's not good, not good clinical manufacturing and you can't just come in and change variables because you had a wonderful idea the night before. So I, I think the rigour of quality programs is essential to safety and to, to having a quality product. No, I fully agree actually with uh, what has been said. I think that in, in terms of the concept, uh, yes, uh, but uh, mainly you know more on the processes uh, other than product itself. Okay, so I want to turn it over to regulatory considerations for manufacturing. And so we've just had this historical meeting uh, with the FDA on four different guidance documents and a lot of discussions. They were open to hearing it. They're still uh, in discussions about it and making a decision. But how do you feel this is going to affect the field? So it, if it goes one way and they're able to change and amend, um, how might that affect the field or if it actually comes out the way it is and there aren't changes to those standards, um, how do you think that that's going to affect the field? So they're, they're um, basing them on, you know, what some people feel is, is a bit narrow, um, um, the thought on those guidance documents. So minimally manip manipulated and, and really um, looking at uh, products such as adipose-derived stem cells that, you know, if you're expanding those or, or manipulating them in, in any way, then you, you would have to license and it would require pre-market approval. So um, how do you think that that would affect the field? Uh, we, we have all of these um, products being produced right now and under those new guidance documents, if they were kept the way they are, um, it would pretty much require everybody to go to pre-market approval with that. I, I guess I, so I haven't stayed totally up to speed with where the direction they're going. I was more waiting to see what they come out with because I find they they tend to make their decisions fairly um, in, in isolation to be, be honest. But um, I, I think the the regulations as they exist, to my mind, are, are very flexible, and I think people, um, a lot of, there's a lot of misconceptions out there. I think the concept of taking products to a registration trial, there are many products that have been approved on phase two data. It depends upon the actual disease, the impact. If you can show that your product has a better efficacy than standard of care, or if there is no standard of care, then you can put in an application at any time. So you could have some minimal phase two data that shows, to, as opposed to doing nothing, that you can have a clinical benefit for patients. That could be, could get you approval. So I think people see this as a lot more rigorous than it actually is, and I think we, um, there's, there's the opportunity to move cellular products forward a lot faster just because many of the diseases, there's no therapy exists. So having something that can become standard of care. So having said that, I think the, the bigger issue here really is, is insurance reimbursement. Yeah. I think people mm -hmm. focus so much on the, regular, on the FDA in the US 
it doesn't matter if you get something approved, if the insurance companies aren't going to reimburse it, then it's going to be a problem. And I, I, when Arnie Kaplan was giving his thoughts on um, having a, 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 an approval based on safety, I think what, what is missing in that discussion is you might get some approval from the FDA, but I'll guarantee there's no way the insurance companies are going to pay for, for, for sale of products which are going to be fairly expensive based upon a safety data. Their argument's going to be there's no efficacy, there's no proof of eff efficacy, they're not going to cover it. It is possible that with that model you could have Medicaid, Medicare, where the government will reimburse, but I think it's only a partial solution and I think the insurance aspects of it really need to be thought about in much more detail. Um, I would add to that that I think that many of the discussions were also triggered by the idea that Japan was actually moving the regulatory uh, pathway in a much faster track pace and everybody was like flying to Japan to put their therapies there in order to be approved first than in the US because the regulatory environment was, well, if it's safe and if it's autologous, uh, just in phase two, you can just go ahead and, and with consent use the therapy. So I think that that triggered a lot of conversation that FDA was slow and FDA was um, very much uh, stringent in their, in their approach. And I, I have to agree with Ian, I think that is not necessarily that case, uh, but it happens many times that uh, products are approved and eventually the reimbursement becomes the bigger bottleneck. And I think that is going to be the next uh, issue for this industry actually moving and, on. And just to add one thing, I mean the difference with the Japanese situation is their public health system yes. in, in, in large part. So, the government has the ability right. to say we've That's approved right. this so that it'll be reimbursed. Yes. But that, that is very different here in the US because of the insurance companies. Yeah. yeah, so we really won't be able to take their data and look, kind of look at that model and see if it works because it's going to be very different. And I think that if we don't start thinking earlier on about reimbursement where you should be thinking about that at phase one, mm -hmm. that that's where we're not going to have success because we're not going to have the money mm -hmm. to be able to pay for the therapies. Bazad, what do you think? What do you think? No, I think in, again, I'm not a regulatory expert, but uh, just my personal opinion. Uh, I, I think in Japan, the situation exactly what uh, you're saying is, is different in the sense that the government, you know, is uh, take care of this uh, uh, reimbursement. But when you think also about this uh, regulatory, the, I think the innovative component of that is the commercial incentive basically uh, is not necessarily kind of the overlooking or jumping, you know, over obstacles. Uh, uh, you need always, you know, to show the safety, uh, some degree of uh, efficacy, but the real innovative component of that is the commercial in incentive, which is, uh, you know, regulated by the, by the government in the sense that you can have, you know, some reimbursement uh, while, you know, you are doing in some extent your clinical or equivalent to your clinical uh, studies. Um, in U.S., uh, can we do that? I think it uh, comes uh, to question of the insurance. The structure is different. And uh, you know everybody looking for the uh, quality, uh, quality, quantity, uh, ICER, you know, incremental uh, cost effectiveness compared to what is the standards. So, so it's much more complex. But I think uh, uh, in terms of the regulatory, maybe you know things can be accelerated, but not necessarily jumping, you know, over the uh, uh, important elements like uh, you know safety, efficacy. Um, in any case, you cannot generalize because I think that in, in terms of organs and, and tissues is going to be yeah. a different story. There is such a shortage of organs and organ for organ transplant that most likely actually this situation could be a very different. So that's why we right. cannot generalize perhaps. Mm -hmm. We can just look into one, one specific case at a time. Right. No, no, I agree. And I agree with you that I think that the FDA is flexible. But I think that if the standards come out as such, it's going to change the way these therapies are executed and approved and how much they cost. So um, for some of them out there, it would change. And yeah, I, I do agree that tissue engineering and where we don't have enough um, kidneys for transplant or what have you, that should be handled in a different manner. Um, can we uh, just change? Well, first of all, I'm going to ask if anybody else has questions from the audience. No, okay. So, um, as we're talking about, and, and maybe this is a little bit, but cl clinical trial design, do you feel like in the clinical trials as we're getting the products, 
is there really enough of a team effort and education in how we should be setting up the clinical trials? I think clinical trial design uh, with a biologic is very different than a drug product, and maybe, Bazad, you might have a comment about it being from pharma, um, and should, should the model be handled the same way in biologics? It's not necessarily in academia, you know, we... Um, I think maybe one big uh, trend actually you see in the pharma actually is a, a more what we call like a precision medicine. And the, the precision medicine, so basically um, today, you know, we take the drugs and uh, you take uh, the drug like an axiom. Um, and this is uh, efficient actually in the one out of 25 people, so like a 4% efficacy. Um, Humira is a one out of uh, four, so 25 percent. So what we see actually, uh, the trend is now to try actually to uh, look at the more genetic profile of the patient and see if you know this is compatible with the drug or not. So basically, you don't change necessarily you know your manufacturing or the drug itself, but basically you try to see if the patient actually is compatible with that. And this is a huge benefit because now, you know, you are going to increase, you know, the efficacy. So the size of the drug is going to be smaller, uh, the quantity, but then, you know, you're going to have a much better uh, efficacy. Now, what we see here, actually, in the clinical design, we see the same trends happening right now. So people also, they design the clinical trials with the same perspective in mind. So instead of just, you know, taking random uh, people and try, you know, to... Uh, give them, you know, uh, the doses actually, they try to pre-select based, you know, on the, on the mechanism of action of based on the knowledge to different uh, genomic uh, groups and then try to do the clinical uh, studies on that. I don't know, you know, how much, you know, this type of the approaches can be uh, applied, you know, to the cell therapy, but that might be actually a good approach is because uh, maybe, you know, the, the reason that we see some variability, you know, patient to patient might also come uh, from that. But again, it, it needs a lot of uh, studies and... Actually, I think that the companion kits that are coming up as part of the request of the FDA will help tremendously to identify the population and make it a little bit more narrow and understanding what population is for which indication. I think that the companion kits that are coming with some of the cell therapies will do that, will define the, the population and um, minimize the risk. Can you, can you explain that a little bit more to the, um, to the audience? And uh, companion kits, I actually uh, basically, in, in some particular cases, which I am very familiar with, is using the, giving the cell therapy so to some patients picking up the plasma or the serum and be able to follow some markers and be able to see how the cell therapy is behaving on, on the patient and be able to have a close look into it. Um, as, and eventually look into specific markers on the population that you pick to see if the cell therapy is going to be effective or not, so you make a pre-selection on that. So the companion kit is using some markers and uh, goes together with your cell therapy to understand if the cell therapy applied to those patients on that population that you're looking for, and eventually also to evaluate outcomes afterwards. Do you, do you think we're moving towards big data kind of controlling everything? Is that? That's the idea, I think, at the end. That's what I see coming. Yeah. Ian? Well, I, I think in clinical trial design, I think the, the um, if, if you use CAR T cells as an example, I think it's one of the few cell products that have sort of been centralized by pharmaceutical companies and shipped out. and. I think what you see with CAR T cells is the, first of all, you need significant patient numbers. So there's going to be a focus in academic centers that have large uh, patient populations. Um, the CAR Ts are a good example. I think if you started to look at this going out into the, um, uh, the general physician offices, uh, the, the side effects are far beyond what they're used to dealing with. The, the cytokine storm, the, um, the, there's a number of side effects that are typical more of what transplant patients uh, pre present. And so most of the 
studies are being done in collaboration, at least having transplanters on the, on the teams because managing these patients is very complex. So I think clinical design, you really need to, there's two major things that I think drive it. One is the patient populations, having enough patients, in, in particular um, uh, hospitals and academic centres that you need to get your enrolment through and then B, having the expertise that is, um, understands the disease and understands the potential side effects that are going to occur. Zad, did you have anything that you want to add no, to that? No, nothing to add. Okay, so I know we touched on this a little bit, but um, decentralization and centralizing manufacturing, and I'd kind of like to know your thoughts on it. I was actually in a meeting um, via Skype in London a couple weeks ago on bioprinting, and there were just a lot of concerns, and they were talking, well, we could, you know, centralize, and I was thinking, well, when I'm thinking about bioprinting, the whole point of, um, you know, these devices is that maybe you get them out to the site and you produce the product and you're closer, and then once we understand the product and we can control it, we have complete control over it, then we could centralize it and start shipping the organs out throughout the country. But cells and everything else for manufacturing, how do you feel about centralized or decentralized manufacturing of the product? I, I, I think it's, um, there's going to be examples which are easy to, to centralize and there's going to be other cell products that um, are going to be easily um, processed or, or developed locally. So again, bone marrow transplant, there are um, processing labs all around the country. It's, they're very minimal manipulation in most cases, but those labs also can handle things like um, cell selection and uh, other somewhat more complex um, processing. So I, I think there is going to be a development of more local manufacturing in, in ac particularly academic settings and even in um, some of the more uh, the smaller pri um, public hospitals more, you know, out of the, the major city areas, I think that's going to be essential. The other, the other thing I think is, which is important to understand is pharmacies don't want to touch these cell products. Pharmacies aren't familiar with, they don't have the ability to, to store frozen cryopreserved products. So having some lab function locally is going to be important in many of the products because they've, they've either been cryopreserved, they need to be thawed and um, washed in some cases, or they need to be stored. And, and so how that is undertaken, I think there is going to be a continued need for local labs and exactly how um, broad the labs are is going, to, is going to vary. I think that the decentralization will require standards, yeah. will require a maturity of the industry that we are not there completely yet, even though I agree with Ian, there are some products that had been historically uh, manufactured uh, in hospitals, so they have perhaps the know-how and the footprint for that, but still for cell therapy products that need a little bit of more modifications or, or other type of treatments, most likely that decentralization will require standards and a little bit of more, at least, regulatory scope. I think that that is the 2.0 version of, of what we are today and will require a little bit of more maturity in the space from my perspective. No, I think that's, uh, that's true, uh, and I think we, we need to separate, again, uh, the minimally manipulated. I think this uh, can be, uh, you know, decentralized and even at the bedside in some extent, uh, compared to more than minimally manipulated. Um, and more than minimally manipulated, again, uh, I think on the allergenic side is uh, always going to be more centralized model, but when you go uh, mainly to the autologous, uh, I think it really depends, because uh, if you think about that, the decentralization uh, has a cost attached to that. So normally, you know, from the cost perspective, it's going to be more costly if you, everything is from scratch, uh, you know, to handle that. Uh, so you need to have a reason why, you know, you try to decentralize. Right. Uh, for example, you know, for the uh, product, you know, you cannot uh, deliver in the time and so on. So if there is a valid reason, then, you know, you need to develop that. But at the same time, also, I think the complexity of this autologous, I think we need to look at this from the manufacturing perspective, but also from the marketing perspective. Because uh, in, the, in the more like, a, again, a formal model, uh, um, the only thing I need to do actually is to pass an advertisement with the name of my product. 
and then people go to the doctor and you know push the doctor you know to uh, prescribe them you know the, the, the medication for them uh, in the autologous world is slightly different you know you need to have kind of the develop one to one relationship with the doctor with the each center and when you think about for example again we take this uh, dandron model and we talk about the, the uh, manufacturing part of that but we need also to talk about the marketing part of that. Uh, Dandron, they had uh, 3,000 patients. In order to get to 3,000 patients, they have developed 700 uh, point of the care. Because you know you need to educate you know, the medicine, you know, how you get, take you know, the, the samples you know, from the patient, how you're going to send that to me, how you're going to you know, send that back, how you're going to treat you know, the patient. So it's a very complex uh, situation that we need to take that into account uh, from this perspective. Uh, and uh, you know, then the question of the uh, uh, you know applications or uh, implementation, you know, in the patient at the point of the care, the standardization, you know, might uh, help a lot, you know, to increase uh, uh, the demand and penetration uh, uh, of the market uh, share in that regard. I agree. I think you brought up a lot of good points, and I'm wondering how all these academic facilities will end up being able to uh, produce these GMP facilities and so forth, and that's. Yeah where that, you know, kind of yeah. comes up, do we yeah. decentralize or centralize? Because can they really afford to have that type of facility? Um, I think uh, the model that it goes, uh, for example, again, I, I give uh, the example of the loans uh, in which model that actually we are working on the, uh, um, uh, such a solution, uh, we are going more towards uh, personalized uh, bioreactors, which are fully automated, and uh, uh, so it's a uh, one bioreactors per patient, uh, based on the single-use uh, technology adapted, you know, for the given process. So we try to kind of simplify that. But having said that, you are going to need a, a, a GMP facility and GMP uh, experience. So it's not uh, just, you know, at the bedside it's going to happen. I think the answer is no. But in the centralized mode, in the hospitals who has the GMP capabilities, and if you have, you know, an easy solution, to be handled, then it becomes a compatible. And then it's, it's really a matter of the financials, you know, is, does it make sense, you know, if it do it decentralized or use, you know, the facility. So it's kind of a more case by case. But I think the solution that at least, you know, from our perspective, we are looking is something can be really adapted to different uh, needs. You know, if you want to do it centralized, that's a perfect. If you want to do it, you know, in the decentralized way, the solution is going to be adapted uh, uh, in that case. Okay, any, any other questions? We have about four minutes left from the audience. Um, anything that we didn't touch on today? And